Indians lived in this country long before your people ever came to America. He hunted animals when he needed something to eat, or when he needed skins and furs for clothing or ceremony. Most of all, he hunted because he needed food to live. He did not hunt because he liked to chase and kill animals. Indians loved to dance and did many animal dances, using the antlers of the deer or buffalo horn headdresses, as well as the beautiful feather headdresses. He would sing songs about them. He would imitate their movements. He told many stories about them and painted pictures of them too. Here are some paintings of animals by Indian artists. Bear liked berries and juicy roots and fish and animals. Nothing seemed to be too large or too small to interest a hungry bear. He will even munch on a pine cone. These eagles are returning to their nest with food for the young. They build their nest high on the mountains or cliffs away from danger, where they can look out over the whole countryside. They stand for courage, for power, and for nobility. Only the bravest warriors were allowed to wear the feathers of the eagle. This deer is grazing in a clearing in the forest. The mother deer has seen and heard the eagle and is trying to save her fawn, which she has hidden behind the bush. She rushed out into the open to make the eagle chase her and to forget all about the fawn. Animals look after their young ones just as people do. Everyone is fleeing from this dangerous prairie fire. The antelope, the wolves, and the Indians are all desperately trying to get away. Winter has come to the Navajo reservation. The family burrows are being loaded with firewood. This picture is from way up in the North Country, in Alaska. Who is that sneaking up on the walruses? Do you see that polar bear in the water? The buffalo was a very important source for food and clothing for the Plains Indians. This picture shows the old-fashioned Navajo buffalo hunt. The hunter is riding his specially trained buffalo horse. A good way to get yourself a fine buffalo horse was to catch one. Here's a herd of wild horses. They are being stampeded and driven into a corral. After catching yourself a horse, the next stop is to break him in and make him gentle enough to ride. If an Indian got lost in a snowstorm, the Indian brave depends upon his trusty horse to help him find his way home. Indian ladies had their own horses too. The little papoose is enjoying a ride in something not so very different from the car seat your little baby brother or sister rides in. These Comanche Indian ladies on their gentle horses are picking wild fruit. Do you know what kind of fruit they are picking? I'll give you a hint. It starts with a P, and it is common right here in Oklahoma. Persimmons. See the baby? Boys had their own horses too. Here some boys are enjoying a lazy summer day, sleeping and playing games, while their horses wait patiently until it is time to go home. Of course, Indian boys and girls have pets, just as you do. 
This boy's teaching his dog a trick or two. The little girls love their baby lambs. The grandfather and the grandchildren are having some fun racing that donkey. But it is not all play. There is the family flock to take care of, and the dog does his share. A couple of skunks. You know how careful you must be. Never, never tease a skunk. This horse, surprised at seeing a skunk, rears and is about to throw the rocker. Another accident, but not so serious. A rear-end collision between a ram and an Indian clown called a kushara. Indian artists like to paint animals not only as the eye sees them, but also with more imagination, as the mind sees them. Here is a hawk, seen as a beautiful design, made when the sun brings out the many colors in his feathers. This turkey is getting into big trouble. He is raiding the corn patch. The ghosts are spirit horses from Indian and cowboy tales. Indians did not have horses until the Spaniards brought them into this country long, long time ago. But soon, they became wonderful horsemen. These decorative ones are from old Navajo tales. There are also completely imaginary animals from other Indian stories, and these always delight the children. Here is storytelling picture. It represents an Indian telling a story. We know he is a Plains Indian, for the teepee is made of skins, and his costume is the type worn by the Plains Indians. This story I'm going to tell you, however, is not from the Plains Indian. It is from the desert country of New Mexico. Have you ever heard the story about insect man and coyote? The Acoma Indians live high on a cliff that reaches straight up from the desert floor. But they go down to the sandy desert to plant the corn, the squashes, and other foods. Insect man knew this, so he decided he would plant for himself a patch of squashes so he could store them away for his winter food. Every day he would come down to see how his squashes were growing and to sing over them. And he was there, too, to keep the weeds from choking the plants. One day, when looking them over very carefully, he was surprised to find one of the best and sweetest squashes had been stolen. Who could that thief be? Who has been stealing my squashes? He sat down to think what he could do. And he thought, and he thought, and he thought. Then he looked about until he found a tiny, sharp stick. He went up and down and up and down from one squash to another. He tasted each one to find the sweetest one in the whole pack. Then he made a hole in the squash, in the sweet squash, and he took his stick and he crawled inside. Now I will find out who has been stealing my squashes. About that time, Coyote Man came walking along. He stopped and he smelled and he smelled each 
squash until he came to the sweetest one of all, the one in which Insect Man was hiding. Coyote gobbled it right down, Insect Man, stick and all. Now down inside Coyote, Insect Man was exploring. He was very dark in there, and he couldn't see anything. But he kept feeling his way and singing his little song. Moti, 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 moti. Coyote thought he heard someone sing. He looked all around. First one side, then other side. He couldn't see anyone. And he couldn't figure out where that sin was coming from. He began to run. He ran or tried to run away from it. Every time he stopped, he heard that old singing going on. He didn't feel good. And he was scared. Now, Insect Man was very busy with the sharp stick he was poking around, looking for something. Coyote was yelling, Oh, 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 oh what a stomachache I have. And he was running in circles. He was in such great pain, he thought he was going to die. He couldn't get rid of that song either, just like an old spirit song. Insect man was working hard now. He couldn't find what he was looking for. He touched something. But he was sure that was Coyote's liver. That was not what he wanted. Next, he found Coyote's lungs, because he could hear him breathing. That wasn't what he was looking for either. Here it is. This is his heart. This is what I want. So, insect man took his sharp stick, and he pushed, and he pushed, and he pushed with all his strength, and Coyote fell over dead. Then Insect Man crawled out of his dark prison inside Coyote's heart, and he came into the fresh air, and he spread his wings, and he went along home singing, After a time, old Coyote came alive again. At that time, Coyote had magic. But this did teach Coyote a lesson. He never did like squashes anymore. He wouldn't even steal squashes anymore. At least that is what the old ones say. Indians have many little stories like this. Perhaps you will read other little stories this summer, right here in your library. Of your birth? August the 19th, 1895. 
In your present age? 77. 77. Uh, where was the place of your birth? In Arkansas, just south of the west of the Queen. When, uh, when did, uh, approximately, when did your parents move to Oklahoma? They moved to Bates, Arkansas in 1902. And then they moved to Oklahoma in 1903, but it's to live. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in Oklahoma all that time. <laughs> Now, after they lived at Bates, Arkansas, then they moved to Oklahoma. Where did they live? They moved to Hoover first. Yes. And then after that? They moved to just about one mile north of here, on Concha Creek, right on the bank of the creek. All right. Uh, could you tell me your father's name? A. M. Wright. And uh, do you remember the date of his birth? Uh, December the 15th, 1915. And uh, what is the date of his death? Do you remember that? November the 9th, 1915. All right. Do you remember the place of your father's birth? Yes, ma'am. One mile west of Hebron on the Independent Road. Oh, I see. What was your mother's name, her maiden name before she married. Roxy Chardona. Oh. That's Do you remember the date of her birth? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, the same year as my father. Same year as my father. Well, that's, that's good enough. And what about her dad? She died uh, December the 5th, 1915. And what was your mother's name? Do you remember the date of their marriage? This oh, is not too really important. It was pretty early. We were before we left uh, Arkansas. And you, when you lived in the concert community, you stated that you uh, worked for Mr. Thompson. And what was that year when you worked for him again? You I worked for him 19 and 12 and 13. Yes. Now, you roomed in the house at that In the time. bedroom upstairs, the south west corner. Yes. Now, what kind of work did you do? Well, mostly feeding stock and breaking ground. Yes. <clears throat> now, there was a smokehouse, they tell me, just uh, back of the big house. Yes, sir. And I'd like for you to tell me all you can remember about this smokehouse. Well, when we first moved to Oklahoma, my grandfather lived up here for the real bank here. And uh, we lived with him for two months, two weeks, before we went to school. We'd come here to the post office and stole it. We got a plane to this man. And right away, my father had to get your home. And I was a small boy, but it would come with him. We'd get you from 10 to 15 big holes. About four or five neighbors going together and having butchered the hog. Then he would cut all that meat up, we put it in the smokehouse, smoke it on this big bank, and uh, he would pass so much money, he would give us backbones and livers and stuff like that. Well, by 18, log wall with a board shingle roof. And the shed all on the west side for his yard tools and his small farming tools. Wow. 
of the stuff in there. What kind of logs? They're they? pine logs. Pine logs. Mm -hmm. uh, were they peeled? Mm -hmm. Peeled pine logs. Yes. Were they not to fit? They were not corners. Yes, ma'am. And uh, what about the? Was there any kinking of the space between? No, the it was open, but the logs were closed. Just so the air could go, but no cats or nothing like that could go inside. I see. Um, Underpinned all around with rock. I see. With mortar. Oh, I see. Well, uh, <clears throat> now we're thinking of uh, building uh, some restrooms, you know, for the public that visits there, and we thought we might rebuild the smokehouse and put the restrooms in the smokehouse. The reason I'm wanting this detailed information, you see. Now, was there a floor in the smokehouse? No, ma'am. The Just dirt floor. Dirt floor. Mm -hmm. And uh, did the floor have a an excavation where they could it was build. gravel with red clay and it packed down. I see. It was put in damp and it had it packed down with a whole time wood mold. You saw them? Yes. The floor was packed, packed down with a wood mold. Then every year before he butchered the hogs, maybe half inch, inch, whatever level it. I see. You know, it would get dirty and greasy when he had all that meat in there and he mowed that down every year before he killed hogs. Well, that's unusual. Uh, did he uh, build a fire in the excavation in the floor? He would let that meat stay in the smokehouse six weeks in the salt. We take that up and wash it in hot water, boiling water. Then he would hang it on the poles, the joists across there. He'd smoke that with hickory trees, hickory chips. Well, now, uh, was there uh, a day, a, I don't know why I would say it. How did he build a fire on the he had the He had some big metal kittles, like big wash kittles, only they were square. And you'd have the, oh, his meat would be as long as this, hanging up to about four pieces wide. It'd be long. And he'd smoke that about six weeks and take it down wrap it in what you call yellow building paper at that time. And then he would put it down in wheat bran in big boxes. Well, that's really Now, that's quite a process, but I have to do that right now every year. Yes, sir. And he just built a fire then in these metal boxes. Mm -hmm. When he just floor. burned down into the cold, he never wanted to blaze. He just wanted to, to, to smoke, you know. Yes. You have the best breakfast bacon and ham. <laughs> yes. He fed his hogs straight corn. Yes. Now they feed him everything. Yes. <laughs> uh, were there split logs in the smokehouse? Round logs. Just, no, I mean, uh, uh, like, were there benches made out of split logs inside the smokehouse? No benches. No benches. Mm -hmm. What you call joists, he put them about every four feet. That's what he put it. Then he put smaller poles this way to hang his meat to. Yeah, I see. He put the joists every four feet across that building. And then he put his small poles up there. He would hang out with the uh, bare grass strand. Oh. <laughs> You've heard of bare grass? Yes, but I don't know much about it. <laughs> you grow about that long. In the early fall, when that was matured, he'd go out and he'd cut, just cut the stool. It was a great big stool. It would be a bunch that big, but it would be about that high. And he would hang that with that bare grass string. <laughs> it'd tie it just like it was buckskin. Yes. Yeah. It was strong. Yeah. The doors were made out of rough lumber, no opening to keep the door.
How far was, do you think, the smokehouse was from the back of the house? I was betting it was 40 feet. Back, 40 feet back of the house. And about 30 feet from the old road. Yes. <laughs> Which the old road ran on the east side of the house up towards the moon. That's right. Yes. My father lived up there when we was, my wife and me was married. Oh, I see. 1970. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, now when you were staying with the concert, who else roomed upstairs besides yourself? Uncle Joe Davis. Oh. Did he have a room to himself? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Was Joe or Sammy the one at home at that time? Joe Conson? Yes. No, ma'am. Mm -hmm. he, he lived over there where Mr. Joe Heener lived, just over in that field at that time. Oh, I see. But he died about uh, two years after I worked for Mr. Conson. Oh, I see. And Sam wasn't at home either? At that time? Sam was married at that time. I see. He lived down here in the house. No. He lived down there where the house burned. Oh, I when the house burned down there, we tore down the store and built the other house. Mm -hmm. do, do you remember seeing the log house before this house was built? No, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. My father was here, but I never did come with him during that time. Yeah. <clears throat> was the uh, cure wise uh, staying at the concerts at that time? She taught school here for three terms, mm -hmm. but I don't just remember the day. Yes. Well, she taught uh, one year at Richard. She and Ada drove in a buggy, they tell me, and taught school at Richard. But, uh, you know, she may have taught here before that, or after either one, I don't know which. Do you know when the old smokehouse was torn down? And no, ma'am, it was still there when I left here, 1930. Seven, thirty-six. But when I came back the second time, I was here at this place, and was a new one built, this little one. Yes. That was built in by Mr. Carnell, wasn't it? The little one. Pretty sure. It's here now. Yes. Do you suppose he used some of the logs from the other one? I don't think so. They were larger logs than them. I was okay. looking at them. One time before I was, well, when I was, I said it's something to him. He got into it, I don't remember him. Oh, they was the large as that base there, the logs out there. <coughs> the board you said that covered the smokehouse was a pine board? Yes, ma'am. Handmade. Handmade. But out of pine trees. Mm -hmm. With the, what, what do you call the two uh, you make them with? Pro. The pro, yes. A pro and a mallet. Pro and a mallet. Take a little hickory sapling about that big around and peel it and make a handle on it, and that is your mallet. Oh, and know, a pro is like that. Got a handle up here. You hit it here and knock it into the timber, and you move that handle back and forth, and that's just go down like that. Between a forked tree, that is what you call your break. Oh, I see. <laughs> we made enough boards one time to recover this barn out here and cover this barn out here. In the year 1914. Oh, really? Well, 
Well, it had the it had the homemade boards on it before that, didn't it? We punched them off and put the new boards on, and later they put the tin roof on after I left it. Do you know? Uh, do you have any idea when the barn was built? It was built before the house, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Well, the first time I saw this house, the barn was still looked new. Yes. You go inside and tell it hadn't been used much. Yes. And the general store was also here before the before the house was built. On it. Now one side room, my father built one side room after we came here, the one on the west side. Had one on the east, but we built one on the S west side after 1908. Now, did he have a separate cow lot for where he kept his cows? Everything the same corral. Cattle, horses, hogs. Oh, really? And no horses stayed in that barn night. Yes. Nothing. Uh -huh. Well, uh, when when he milked his cows, did he uh, did they milk them inside the barn? No, ma'am. When they milked the cow, Ann had a separate corral out here, just a small place. A separate corral out here for milk cow feed and a cow and calf. Was there a shed there or just a corral? A small barn with a shed. Oh, I see. She milked them. Oh, I see. Now she didn't do that. Uh, well, she she quit out about 1918. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, remember about the cars that Peter Thompson had? The first he bought was a Model T Ford, two-seated turn car. You don't know when he bought his car, do you? The year? 19... Nineteen seventeen. Yes, that's about right, I think. Now, uh, I've been told he later had a Willis Knight, do you know? He paid that for in for Willis Knight about three years later. And how long did he keep the Willis Knight? Do you have any idea? Something like that. About three years, mm -hmm. approximately. Did he ever drive the cars himself? Well, he would drive that Model T sound, but he never did see him drive the other car. Okay. Because then he always had a chauffeur, someone, the neighbor, to go to town with him. Yes. Yeah. Before he had the cars, I, I know they had a buggy. One-horse buggy, wasn't it? Was it a one-horse buggy? Well, he had a one-horse buggy, and later he got a two-seated hack. Yes. Yeah. Two horses. Yes. Yeah. Did it have a fringe on top? <laughs> mm-hmm. It did. <laughs> a top over it and curtains on the side. Yes. Yeah. Just put them up like you used to on the old cars. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A lap robe. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> real nice blanket for yeah. lap robe. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, of course he had a wagon. Was that a Springfield wagon? You think? You remember? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, can you uh, recall any other tools that he had? That well, lady had all kinds of small farmer equipment, mm -hmm. like cultivator, breaking plow, and uh, Georgia stock, section hauler, corn planter, and. Uh, Oh, that kind of equipment. Mm -hmm. You don't know when uh, this uh, well out here by the, in front of the barn was 
drill, do you? Probably later after you left. Well, the well out here was here the first time I was ever here, and the well in the back. Yes. But I don't remember one out here. <laughs> Doug drilled after I left. There's a drill well out here. It's right out in front of the barn there, you see. Now, when he watered his horses, what kind of watering trough did he have? He had a big wooden trough. Made out of heavy lumber. About eight foot long, about twenty four inches wide, a foot high. He would draw the water out of that well out there with the chain and the well bucket. Yes. Okay, that's fine. All that stock he watered out of that well in yes. summer and winter. Yes. Well, I've been wondering what kind of a watering trough he had. You know, I'd like to have one made. Yes. Wooden made, handmade out of wood lumber. Yes. Oak lumber. Mm -hmm. He kept it cold hard outside, yes. preserved. Have moss all inside. Uh, well, I was told he had a mule team. Do you remember that? Team of mules? You don't remember a team of mules? Um, just the um, Choctaw ponies? No. When we first came to this country, he had a big gray horse and a big star horse. And he had two saddle horses. Um, can you uh, tell me what kind of saddles he had? Well, he just had a average, old-time riding saddle. Yes. Good saddle, but it was a... You know, just like the, you see a lot of old saddles now, the same as they have now. Yeah. Uh, someone told me that Sam had some spurs made out of a gold coin. Do you remember that? Yes, ma'am. It was true then. He did have mm -hmm. spurs made out of a gold now, coin. Now, they wasn't made out of, of gold. They were uh, inlaid a lot with gold. I see. Mm -hmm. they, you know, that they wouldn't have been strong enough for it to make the yeah, frame. I'm but they've been laid with gold. You'd think they were solid gold, you know. Uh -huh. But I saw them a lot of times. Seen him use them. He was quite a rider. What kind of guns did Mr. Thompson have when you knew him? Winchester. Winchester. 38 72 model Winchester. Lever action. Oh. Uh, did he have any pistols? Yes, ma'am. I think he used 44 pistols, six shooters. Mm -hmm. I saw his guns. They were pretty good sized guns. Do you think that's what he used when he was uh, serving as captain of the Light Horseman? Well, all I think I remember about it, I just heard a lot about it. Personally, mm -hmm. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. You think he did use the Winchester then? Yes, ma'am. He had a, a saddle scabbard, a scabbard, a gun scabbard, to mean, for a saddle. Yes. Like you see on the television. All yes. he had his, the front of it was up like that. They all have theirs sticking back this way. Hmm. Now, if you use that, that gun would lose out the way to run them horses. That's just the show. Oh. <laughs> Old timers all use that gun sticking right up on the right side like that. If they want to use it, we can get that stock when they come around with it. Now they hide on this side. At least get that stock when they come around with it, they already aimed. Oh. And now they have to reach back and get that out of there and pull it out, you know. Yes. You see on the television a lot of time, these cowboy shows, where they got that gun all sticking back down. Yes. Well, you mean they'd have it on the front? Uh, well, when they saddle the horse, they left that scabbard on there all the time. Yes. It was right between the spur leather. The back of it was lower, and the front was up like that. Just dropped that gun in there, and it wasn't fast, and it wouldn't lose out. You could run the horse any place, up or downhill, and never you lose out. I see. 
Then the, the pistol, how would he carry? Did he have a scabbard for his pistol? He had a belt, just like anybody else, yeah. in the scabbard. Mm -hmm. And he very always had a knife on the left side, the gun on the right side, the gun on the left. I mean, the knife on the left. Yeah, I see. And what side of the knife was it? Well, it had about, not too long, about a, not over a seven inch blade. With a handle on it, with a grip on the handle, you know, it fit each finger. It wouldn't slip out of your hand. You take no like that, you had a groove for each finger. Well. Yeah. I've seen the gun, um, gun and knife a lot of times. Yes. Most of the time, he kept him hanging on his bed post. Oh. Right where he lay down to sleep. Mm -hmm. He would say, I can't stand to see the old lady make a fire cover up my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's pretty good. <laughs> oh. Jesus, three or four little kids to get out and he's telling all his story. You just see the Harry. <laughs> <laughs> I see my dad and kids hanging up around him and you got a hug or like that. They wouldn't say one word if he came. Kind of make up ghost stories, I guess. <laughs> he just start talking, he'd just make them up. Yeah. <laughs> as long as they did that, he'd just keep making Just for fun. <laughs> When you say the river concerts, did they attend church regularly? Do you remember? Uh, there was a little Methodist church up here, in the, you know, to the left. And they well, said. That, that church up there was built 19. Up and down board bill. Well, they built that. My dad and us three boys built that. Well, I've been told he gave the ground, you know, to build it on and help help to build it. Is that right or not? My dad taking a contract to build in the house, built that house for one hundred dollars. Oh. The church house. Mm -hmm. Well it's up and down board. That was the labor. Yes, mm -hmm. I see. And the community donated the money for the loan. Yes. And I've been told he at one time had a sawmill. Do you know about that? That he had a sawmill on Pine Mountain. Do you know about that? You don't know about that. Now, I've also been told that the blacksmith shop that he had a blacksmith shop between the store and the barn. Do you recall that? You don't remember the blacksmith shop. How about the grist mill? Do you remember the grist mill? That must have been later after you moved away, I, I, I guess, because I've had several different parties. Now, was there a rail fence around the barn? For a long time, after yes. we were here. Yes. And had the wire fence put in. Yes. <laughs> well, he used to have a paling fence around the house, you know, but later they took that down and just put a wire fence around it. So, I, I guess the rails in time and had a tailored garden back here, fence, large fence with paving. Oh, I see. A bit like we're talking about the board. Did they have an orchard here at the time? Yes, ma'am. You say here. Yes. Just uh, uh, a lot of trees, not a regular orchard, but just a lot of home fruit. Yes. Real nice trees. And uh, did he have uh, beehives out by the side of the orchard yes, when you when you knew? And you stayed here. I've been told it is. Mr. Goforth said that he had a number of Angora goats. Did he have them when you were here? Mm -hmm. He had them when you were here then. But they were always separate from the other stock. Yes. 
and uh, that he shared them and sold the wool. You remember that? Well, tell me anything else now that you can recall that's uh, of interest about the family. Did he have many visitors while you were here? Well, not too many. You recall any certain ones that visited here? Well, my father-in-law, Jim Smith, was a very close friend to him, and my father was... A lady, when we first came to Oklahoma, there had been some people come down here about two years from the same place, Bates, Arkansas, where we live. And they told us that, now, don't be fooled with that old ending up there at the store. You can't get along with it. Well, my father was always a friendly man, and he liked to meet people. He came to the post office with called... Uh, it was called it was it was but still called contra IP at that yeah. time when we came it didn't change yeah. for a long time my father come to the post office in, in two weeks he, he, didn't find, he thought everything got all in yeah. and as long as he lived did your blacksmith work for him did your carpenter work for him did most anything you want to do on bill fence very nice friend, Mr. Collins. Well, I've had so many visits to the house, you know, and they tell of stopping and visiting mm -hmm. with him. Maybe if they were going to here, you know, they'd stop on the way and visit mm -hmm. with him or stop. But I don't know of anybody but what like Mr. Collins. Mm -hmm. Can you recall any of his uh, expressions that were typical of... Uh, his talk in general? Well, no, I don't, really. Well, I thought, you know, he might have certain expressions that, that uh, he would often quote. Heard it's not too nice to mention. He's quite a talker. He could talk, tell you some interesting things. In person. It wasn't a story, it was a person. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't tell you anything unreasonable. What he told, he could back it out. Yeah. Uh, now he had rent <coughs> several of his farms out to white he, people that had permits to come in. Most of the time he would have what's called a sharecropper. Mm -hmm. He would furnish the team, the equipment, feed and everything, and the tenant would get half. Oh, when the crop was harvested. Mm -hmm. Then he had ranches, farms that he rented for crop rent. Yes. Third of the corn, fourth of the cotton, third of the hay, and uh, a third of all the crop except the cotton that was fourth. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Did he uh, raise very much cotton, corn? They were the two main crops, weren't they? Cotton and corn. And had some then in pasture for Well, hay. most all the farmers, about uh, better than half of the crop would be cotton. Yes. But a few years, he would have a small crop in there and hire someone to work. Do you have uh, any idea how many acres was in his farms altogether. Now, before the children, in other words, before they got old enough to claim their own allotment, how many acres would you guess? Well, when we first came to Oklahoma, he had about 100 acres in cultivation. And then every year, he would hire land cleared. If the people lived on the place, they would clear more land, build more fence. And how did he pay them for clearing the land, do you recall? Well, so much for acres. Some of them would clear it. But it was already spent. Some would clear it for the, for the whole crop for three years, what they call a three-year lease. 
But he went he leased some to people that would build a home with a barn and fence it for five years. I see. The way it was already spent and it didn't build no home, no building. They clear the land for the rent for about three years. Yeah. And they had a lot of land put in the first few years we were here. Yeah. Well, on an average, they got about 160 acres per person in the family when they got their land allotment, you know. But if the land was uh, upland, you know, and not good fertile soil, they might get two or three hundred acres or even more. So I have an idea that uh, the family before the children, you know, took their own allotments, had a good many acres of, of land. And uh, then when he married Ann Holson, you know, I'm sure she had an allotment, you know. Well, I guess all together, before any of them passed away, they had, uh, well, they had one farm in Poto Bottom. All the land that I know of, they had in the bottom, and they had a lot of land south of here and west. I guess they had the, well, 300 acres south and west of this place here. Well, he never had a cotton gin, did he? No, ma'am. Where would he cotton take his cotton? Down here on this creek one time, but that was moved, torn down before we came here. Did they have a cotton gin at Hodgins? Mm -hmm. He'd take his cotton there then to have it, mm -hmm. have it gin. Did you know Dr. Fair? Mm -hmm. He was, I've been told he was First there. first school I went to in Arkansas was to Dr. Fair. Oh, I didn't went know. He was two years at Old Gibson, Arkansas. Well. Well, I've been told he was their family doctor, you know. Mm -hmm. And his daughter told me that uh, they used to invite him to the council meeting, yeah. you know. And uh, yeah, I did. My father built a house right there. Just you been to the Baptist Church at Hodgin? Yeah. A white house. That was side left. That's where he lived when he first got married. Came to Hodgin. Doctor Fay. Well, well, they said he would go any time, day or night, when he was called to see people that were ill. Go a horseback. Mm -hmm. He rode a horseback up to 1917. He got his first Model T Ford. Mm -hmm. Didn't make any difference how far, how cold, how rainy he'd be there. Yes. He and Dr. Stewart lived at Heath. Mm -hmm. I knew him, that is, uh, I wasn't personally acquainted with him, mm -hmm. but I do know, know him. And Uncle Peter, he'd go to Fort Smith somewhere, and he'd stay down there a day or two, maybe, you know, and, and uh, so uh, I recollect one time I was in the store at Hodgin and Sim, he came in there, been to Fort Smith and had his arm all wrapped up and him and the fella got into a fight and Fort Smith, Sim was about to drink and they got into a fight and he'd hit him across the arm with a meat cleaver and this guy cut his arm mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, I recollect that very well. And another incident, I heard Peter Conker say, after Slim passed away, I mean Sim, Sim Conker, what is He said that uh, Sim was bad sick before he passed away. Why, uh, he wanted to drink of water out of a certain hole of water up here on Conker Creek. And he got on his little horse. He used to ride a black horse, Uncle Peter did. Got on his black horse and and went up there and got a jug of water out of that certain hole of water for uh, 
for Sam. For Sam. Yeah. Yeah, I recollect that very well. I heard him tell it himself. Yeah. And I don't know, I guess. And uh, Uncle Sam McDaniel, he lived just above us. He had a family and all. And, and uh, everybody, you know, uh, but uh, I don't know, just uh, kind of catered to Uncle Peter. Yeah. You know, Aunt Ann, he went the name of Aunt Ann all the time. Yeah. But uh, we never did uh, go in their home because we yeah. were just kids. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we, you know, too much, but I mean, uh, I'll tell you something else. <laughs> he had a man working for him, a boy, young fellow, young fellow, about, oh, he said about 21 years old. Yeah. And said, uh, put him out to work, but I said he, he, he looked at Blue Mountain all the time. <laughs> and he said, uh, one day he's working, supposed to be working, said he's standing looking at Blue Mountain. And he said, I, I tell him. Uh, let's go to the store and I'll pay you, and, and, and then you go look at Blue Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> I recollect that. Anything like that, you know, uh, he, he'd, he'd tell us, you know. And, yeah. I don't know. We'd come over to the post office. Do you know? Visit with him. Visit with him. Yeah. He, he was, he was, oh, that's a bit, but he was the back of you, you know, all the time. Yeah. And, uh, He'd take a chew of that there star to back her <laughs> and he could talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he enjoyed it. He, he enjoyed people being around him. Oh, yes. He yeah, liked to visit. He did. Uh, did he have to smoke a pipe or do you know? I, I don't recollect that he smoking a pipe. Mm -hmm. But he did chew the back. Yeah. I think I failed to get the first part of your interview because I had impressed the uh, recorder down so we missed a part of that but uh, I, again I would like to have your name I know I didn't get it ma'am yes Clyde Moore and uh, Page Oklahoma mm -hmm. and uh, yeah our route and uh, I live out on the route that way my age yeah uh, born in 1899, 28th day of December, 1899. Mm -hmm. 72 years old, be 73 in December. Yes. Yeah. And your sister's name? May Hill. Now? May Hill, and I live in Taft, California, and I was born in 1902. Yeah. And uh, my husband is... Uh, you know. C.P. Hill. Well, you both lived in this community, though. I did. Oh, yeah. yeah. He didn't go out. Oh, I credit. At that time, no. Yes. But he did go through the country. Yes, he did. He's crazy. Well, anything else you can recall? Was there a fence around the barn? Yes. Do you remember what kind of fence it was?